So we'll look at a few ways of exploring for gold. Quickly go through the data sets that we gather. It's all about gathering large sets of data. So we can start with things like topography and drainage, stream sediments, structural data, petrology, magnetics, any draw data that already exists, SRTM shuttle radar terrain mapping, gravity data, radiometrics, any deposit types you already know about, and of course geology at the end. Now we take all those data sets and we refine them further and then we come down to our exploration license scale. And as you can see there, what we've done is overlaid all those favourable layers and where favourable things for gold deposits overlap on each other, they score um, higher. So the idea is that if there's an area that overlaps about you know, 7 plus, it's going to come up on orange to red on our um, prospectivity map there. What we can do then is focus on those areas. Here it looks like it's pretty good between target two and three. We'd get rid of the blue areas that aren't favorable for gold and also that's good for our reduction on our anniversary period for the license. We do further drilling, prove up resources, reserves, and then we can peg a mining license over the area that we want to, um, to mine. Um, we can also peg licenses over some of the unprospective areas because we need someone to build infrastructure and we don't want to be building infrastructure on top of an area that could um, be prospective in the future. If only it was all that easy, though. The exploration methods, uh, there's mapping, geologist, boots on ground, one of the cheapest ways to do it, going out making observations, smacking rocks with hammers. If rocks aren't available, you can take soil samples, uh, screen large areas of ground, take geophysical surveys uh, from aircraft. It's a closer look at what one of these aircrafts looks like with all the instrumentation and uh, sensors all over it. You can do the same from helicopters, uh, dangling things from there, uh, doing remote sensing of the ground. But at the end of the day, uh, the share market will not take uh, real notice of exploration results until they're in the form of drilling uh, results and drill data. And that's what gets the company's share price moving and uh, attracts the attention of institutional investors. So I'm sure you've seen this graph before. Um, it's from the Jork code. Uh, as exploration results come in, you get more confidence in them. You prove up resources, inferred, indicated, measured, until you get to all reserves. You can't mine unless you've actually got reserves. But what I draw your attention to in the JORT code is clause 13. This states that public reports concerning a company's exploration results, resources and reserves must include a description of the style and the nature of the mineralization. So why is that important? Gold deposits are not created equal. So if you look on the left hand side there's a logarithmic scale. So those deep ones at 10 kilometers deep really are much, much deeper. So they form at different levels of the Earth's crust. Uh, and the fact that they form in different ways gives them different characteristics. You can get narrow, very high grade, small deposits, and you can get very large, low grade deposits. This, to a certain extent, dictates um, the size of the company that would explore for a deposit like this. Generally speaking, smaller junior companies would explore small, narrow, high grade deposits of this variety. Uh, the major companies can and will mine anything, but they usually stick to these high ton, low grade deposits, such as the ones highlighted here. And we'll have a look, closer look at two of these extreme examples. So we'll take Cadia, which is Australia's lowest grade deposit. That's a porphyry gold copper deposit over on the right hand side there. And then we'll look at Andy Well, which is the high grade, small greenstone hosted Archean deposit, which is in Western Australia. So here we are in Cadia. Put a scale bar in there so you can see the size of what we're dealing with. There's Sentosa at the same, same scale. Over on the right there for the Ridgeway Underground, uh, what it looks like there is a sinkhole. There actually is a sinkhole. Why that may not look like a good thing, for a block cave in operation, this is a very good thing. It means that the underground block cave is working properly and uh, propagating to the surface, and we'll have a close look at that in a minute. Underneath the ground, it's a massive operation that's going on. Another handy scale bar that's something that you're familiar with. If we put that at the right scale, that's what we're dealing with. So it goes down to about 1.6 kilometers underground. It's a massive earth moving operation. Again, this is an information slide. Uh, for those of you that want to know more information on block caving, this is uh, one of the best slides that I found that explains it quite simply. For those of you that are really interested, that YouTube link down in the bottom left corner there, it's a computer generated video that goes for about seven minutes. It's, um, it's very good if, you, if that's what you're interested in. So we switched to Andy Well in uh, Western Australia. Much smaller, we're gonna need a much smaller scale bar for this. So we'll go to Marina Bay in uh, the Formula One Grand Prix track. Surface expression of our Andy Well pit pretty much takes out the cricket club and the cricket pitch. And you could fit about four more within there. 
Again with Cadia, the main player Andy Well is underground, however, at a much smaller scale. This time Marina Bay is at the right scale, so we're pr practically each of those towers about 200 metres high. However, the ore body they're mining there from Andy Well is a very, very skinny. As you can see, those tunnels, that's about three metres wide, and that ore body of that quartz vein there is um, about one to one and a half metres wide, but very high grade. So two very contrasting ore bodies, and uh, again, this is more of an information slide, but uh, as you can see, on one side, where we've got narrow ore bodies, on the other side, wide, disseminated bodies, they're the polar opposites of each other. So while you've got low tonnage, higher grade, you've got high tonnage, lower grade. Um, you have higher cost selective extraction on one side, you have low cost bulk mining on the other, which leads to higher production costs for narrow ore bodies, low production costs for um, large disseminated bodies. Everything comes down to a function of scale and cost. So looking at those costs and time frames, the actual resource uh, to start with two um, billion tonnes versus just over a million tonnes, construction time of three years versus nine months, and three years is very generous for that because they had a, a lot of infrastructure already there. So to build from scratch for that block cave, probably you're looking at about five years. Um, the mine life of it, 30 years versus nearly four years. And the big one, the project cost. $2 billion to put the Acadia into production, which again is probably a bit generous, seeing as they had a lot of infrastructure already there. Yet with Andy Well, we brought that into production at a cost of $55 million. So what we're going to do now is theoretically, um, or hypothetically rather, uh, mine an ounce out of each of those deposits. So just in your minds, pick which one you'd like to mine an ounce for that you think you can do it the cheapest. Do you want the high grade deposit or the low grade deposit? The troy ounce is 31.1 grams. So the tonnes required from a high grade deposit is only three. However, our low grade deposit, we need 62 tonnes of ore. Different mining methods here that have different costs. $55 a tonne for our high grade deposit, much higher. Only $7 for our block cave. However, because of the amount of tonnes that we're moving, we're producing an ounce at our high grade small mine for only $165, whereas at our uh, low grade mine, it's costing us uh, over double that. So those of you who are thinking that you'd rather mine the high grade deposit now, hold that thought for a minute because uh, we haven't put the copper in yet. So every tonne of ore in Cadia contains 0.2% copper. 0.2% copper, 2,000 grams to 2 kilos. So at roughly at current prices, um, an Australian uh, dollar price per tonne of copper of 7,700. So we're looking at about $7.70 for a kilo. We've got two kilos in every tonne of ore at Cadia. So that's 124 kilos of copper times that by 770, and that's an extra $955. That has more than paid for just getting the gold out and then, and then some. This is another extreme uh, example of a deposit. This is the west side deposit in Jundee. And uh, you see the pen there for scale, but the rock in the middle there, I mean, it's seven kilograms per tonne. It's, uh, it's quite astounding with um, not much either side of it. Now, uh, a tonne of rock would roughly, to visualise that, it's about a, a, a square cubic metre. And uh, seven kilos of gold, um, the standard bank vault uh, house brick uh, bullion bar is 12 kilos. So you're looking at about half a house brick of gold in one cubic metre of rock. Now, to mine that, uh, you get, you're obviously going to have to take some of the wall rock, as it's called, either side of it and dilute it down. So to minimise this, there's a process called air ligging. And uh, essentially, it's a big pneumatic drill uh, that gets as much of that high grade rock out as possible. So we'll now switch to the super pit in Kalgoorlie. Now this is a high grade deposit which is being mined as a bulk tonnage operation. The super pit used to be mined uh, by people underground in tunnels with those air leg uh, drills. This is the gold mine in 1940. It's a bit of a busy picture here, uh, but there's, in its heyday there were 80 individual shafts working on the golden mile, each mining high grade ore from separate tunnels underneath. There's 3,500 kilometres of development of tunnels and shafts underneath the super pit. Now, to visualise how far that distance really is, 3,500, that's the equivalent of going from Singapore to Australia, the top of Darwin. In a straight line, they could have dug a tunnel from Perth to Kal Kalgoorlie and gone over the other side of the country to Brisbane. And some of those shafts go down to 1.6 kilometres. And the current pit is down to about 0.6 kilometres. In the 1980s, it made more sense to uh, mine this deposit as an underground, as an open pit, rather than continue with the underground uh, deposits. The reason being, not like the west side deposit that we looked at before, that had no alteration either side of that very high grade structure. The super pit did have low grade ore either side of a very high grade structure. So therefore, um, 
the economics added up to be able to mine it as a very large bulk um, operation. So as you can imagine, mining an open cut pit through a legacy of underground workings uh, does have its um, problems. There's a blast hole rig drilling happily until it finds one of those old shafts. Hence the reason for probe drilling, to find out where uh, that network of tunnels is on the floor, and uh, you can see them, some of those cross tunnels poking out the side of the pit wall there. This is what the super pit looks like today. Once again, Sentosa Island is a very handy scale bar. Pit pretty much takes up the whole of the island there. And the super pit's mined with um, massive machinery, uh, 225 tonne trucks. Uh, that excavator at the top there, the bucket on that uh, can lift 55 tonnes, so about four scoops from that will fill one of those trucks. And it can do that in about two and a half minutes. When, when we talk about exploration and, and you know finding reserves and all that, one inevitably would come uh, bear in mind Briex, you know, the big story scandal a couple of years back. So 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 would 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 uh, such a repetition, you know, less likely to happen now we got all the whatever checks and balances in place? Yeah, I think it would be very unlikely for another Briex uh, to happen. It's a very interesting story. But uh, I mean a lot of things changed after Briex. Uh, Briex changed uh, the Canadian reporting system, the NI43101, it's uh, a lot more stringent. Uh, the JORC code has also uh, been revamped from uh, 2004 to 2012, um, which encompasses a lot of things, not things like fraud, but the, um, the whole thing about having independent people uh, verifying a resource is very important. So you can uh, you, you go to site and uh, Actually, Briex was a big scam where people did go to site as well and uh, had the wall pulled over their eyes, very much so. Um, but uh, I think, it, yeah, it would be a lot harder to do uh, these days.